It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to Science on Top, episode 220. Today is Sunday, the 3rd of April, 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And a special guest this week, he's a medical doctor who was accepted into medicine at Monash University when he was only 16 years old, and I'm sure nobody has ever described him as Australia's Doogie Hauser. That never happens, I'm sure. But he's perhaps best known as the host of Embarrassing Bodies Down Under. Welcome to the show, Dr. Brad McKay. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that amazing introduction. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm sure that never comes up for Doogie Hauser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never have, people all, actually, no. have people actually ever called you that? Uh, yeah, through the years. Through the okay. Years. So yeah. it's, it's not just a dated reference that no one else will get. It's actually... <laughs> cool. oh. No, not, not too dated. You're still cool and hip, yes. Yeah, thanks for making me feel old by saying that, Shane. <laughs> oh, that's fine, man. <laughs> Dude, uh, you, just got called, you just got called hip. I, <laughs> I'd, I'd take it and run. <laughs> Is hip a very dated word in itself? <laughs> that was my irony. <laughs> I'm glad somebody picked uh, up. Uh, irony has <laughs> never been my strong point. <laughs> uh, well, do you want to give us a quick um, a rundown on what Embarrassing Bodies Down Under was all about, Brad? Uh, yeah, it was filmed a few years ago. Um, it was on uh, Foxtel and then Channel 9 last year. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's basically, uh, for those people who haven't seen it, it's uh, getting a big truck to pull into a shopping centre. And then uh, we get a lot of people that, that just turn up and say, I haven't seen the doctor for about six years and I've got this giant tumour coming out of my side. What can you do for me? Uh-huh. Um, or it's it's an embarrassing swollen okay. testicle or uh, or odd and unusual pain. So yeah, so we, we basically do a GP examination and then if necessary send them off to see a surgeon and then follow them up afterwards. So we don't vote anybody off an island. <laughs> um, there is no uh, no torture, uh, or sometimes there is torture, but that's medical procedures. But yeah, a lot of the time it's it's all uh, a feel good show and everybody wins at the end. Excellent. Excellent. So I guess the question that you're probably always asked when you talk about this is, what's the weirdest thing that you ever saw or what's the grossest thing? Or Do you have any more memorable more stories? More memorable tra- times in the truck. Um, yeah, I, I suppose one of the more memorable cases was a guy that came in who'd been noticing his testicle was swelling over about eight or nine months. And so, yeah, he, he dropped his dax in hold, the, in hold the on truck. Hold on a second. <laughs> Just back up a sec. Yeah. This guy's testicle had been swelling for nine months and he hadn't gone and seen anybody about it. Um, he'd seen he'd seen a couple of doctors, but he was oh, still awaiting you. awaiting surgery and uh, and was waiting and okay. waiting and waiting and wondering oh, what to do about it. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, so okay. he got yeah. to a stage where he couldn't wear underwear because it was so big. Um, oh. His testicle was about the size of a mango, uh, and he, Wait, they're not he supposed to be drained. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 if both of them are the size oh, of a right. mango, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but just <laughs> one of them is the problem. You wish it, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, it's got awkward again. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my life. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, I, that, so that's a, a hydra seal, then, isn't it? That you is just, a hydra seal. Well done. Uh, Ten points. Yeah. Uh, just do so. You would just drain the fluid, and then it'd be right. You, would you have to wait for surgery for that? Can't you just? Uh, you know, it, well, it depends it on private surgery versus public surgery. There are waiting lists. Um, yeah, and some people take priority. So unfortunately, he had just been waiting for a, for a very long time and was sort of getting a little bit desperate. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's easily drained. Sometimes uh, the fluid comes back again, and so you, you have to do the procedure again and, and um, yeah, do a, a few more technical uh, just, surgical things. But, yeah, tech- it's usually easily treated. Technical question, do you give him anesthesia first of any kind? Usually you'd knock them out these days, yeah. So yeah. you'd uh, yeah. need the full the full surgical equipment. I would be asking for the full knockout. I was, I was going to say, don't worry, Shane, it's optional. You don't have to have that. <laughs> if no, you no, no, really I... want to do it <laughs> without <laughs> anaesthetic, uh, yeah, you might need to chat to a couple of people. Oh, dear. Or there's probably a fetish club for you. So we'll see how things go. So this yeah. is a friendly podcast going well. <laughs> 
covered large balls and fetishes. So, yeah, we're, we're going strong. <laughs> right. Well, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because we've got a, a big story here about people who are desperate for treatment and recognition of some sorts because you wrote an article for news.com.au called The Great Australian Lime Conspiracy which is a fascinating read. And a few weeks ago, we uh, talked a little bit about Lyme disease and there was uh, a, suspected that there was another bacteria that may have been causing similar symptoms uh, in the US. But what we didn't realise was just how controversial it is in Australia. And there are lots of people who believe they have Lyme disease that they've caught in Australia, but it's not officially recognised as such, is it? Uh, it, it's not officially recognised in Australia that we have Lyme disease. Uh, certainly, the, we've been testing for, for decades to try to find and, and diagnose what's causing people to be sick after being uh, bitten by Australian ticks. But the science still isn't clear on what's causing this mysterious illness. Uh, and my, my article that I wrote caused quite a stir around the place because the, I was basically saying the same stuff that scientists have been saying for a long time, but uh, just putting it in sort of easy to understand terms and, um, and making sure that people were, were sort of like getting a bit of a, a good summary, a good overview about what was happening. Uh, so, so yes, I did write an article recently which caused quite a stir around Australia and around the world and especially in the Lyme community of Australia. Uh, and, yeah, like, I, I, I think a lot of people don't realise what a controversy it is and how passionate people are about it. Uh, and certainly, I, I've seen a lot of patients that have been told that they have Lyme disease or have had Lyme disease from Australia. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different patients that I have seen, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. So the, the article that I wrote was just wanting to um, voice my opinion about what's, what I think is going on and what the science says is happening and, um, and really sort of uh, highlighting that, uh, that I think some people are being ripped off. That was the main sort of point of my article, that people are spending a lot of money on tests that aren't accredited, um, that they're having, um, uh, yeah, a lot of, um, what should I say, yeah, a lot of treatments that are inappropriate, and they're wasting a lot of money on, on what the, what's going on. So basically testing and treatment is costing them thousands and thousands of dollars and, and causing a lot of people who are actually quite sick and unwell um, who aren't working, uh, and then it's costing them a lot of money that they don't have. So that was, that was really where I was coming from. Uh, the problem is that uh, a lot of people that are passionate about Lyme disease um, find this to be, uh, I suppose, as part of their identity. That's about the best way that I can describe it. And, and if you're challenging them that they may not have Lyme disease, they find like it's telling them that they're not white or that they're not black. Like they're, mm. they're, there's such a, an intense passion that's about it. And they've often been treated quite unwell by a lot of other GPs and other infectious disease physicians. And so when, when somebody's actually trying to be on their side and, and trying to help them, they, they put up a big wall. And, uh, and I had a lot of uh, backlash from it, both from emails, um, from, from comments online. And um, yeah, just got absolutely uh, trolled by by people um, for, uh, for a couple of weeks after the article came out and then we was criticised for, for blocking a few people that were saying some uh, callous remarks, shall we say. Mm. Um, and, yeah, like Welcome totally, to like I think some, but yeah, the internet's a great thing sometimes, uh, but it's a horrible thing at other times and this is the first episode of me being trolled. Yeah, so this is actually reminding me a lot of the anti-vaxxer movement and the yep. sort of associated crap, well, I, I've, Yes, I'll use the word crazy. It's fine. I'll, <laughs> I will use the, that that term because it's strange. Because as soon as you, ch yeah, as you said, challenge people's belief system in this, like, and as you said, they've got this, this really, really deep seated belief that they have this disease. And I sort of get why, in a lot of ways, if you're an un, if you're an un, well, if, if you don't know much about the disease and you're and you've looked at Doctor Google and you've figured out that you've got these very similar symptoms, and all of a sudden people are saying, no, this is you haven't got this but yet you've been sick for a long, long time and you can't figure out what it is and you're frustrated. I suppose you would get to a stage where you're like, you get very defensive about your self-diagnosis. 
Yeah, yeah. and I, I think a lot of people are called crazy and that, that's really quite stigmatizing as well. And, and I don't, I don't quite agree with, with that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people are trying to get help and they're, they're very genuine in it. Uh, but I think a lot of people are sort of leading them down a pathway and, and sort of not, not quite telling them the truth and not backing their, their treatment with, with science based medicine. Uh, so this is this is causing a lot of problems around around Australia and around America as well and around Europe. There's a lot of uh, crazy treatments that are being used, uh, but not not quite for crazy people. Mm. Yeah. So so let's pull back then. I guess we need to firstly say that there are people in Australia who do have Lyme disease, but they caught it through a tick bite, say in America or Europe, for example. Uh, yeah, and certainly I, I was very clear in, in my language saying that uh, we don't have any observed cases of Lyme disease occurring from people that are being bitten by Australian ticks. Uh, but a lot of people were misquoting me saying that Dr. Brad says that it, that Lyme disease doesn't exist in Australia. Mm. But but it's like, no, I was quite careful with my language. So yeah, so people like Lyme disease is a thing. It's, re it's real. Uh, and people yeah. uh, do catch it when they're overseas. Uh, it's, it's very well known to occur, to occur in, in America and also in Europe. And people do bring it back with them to Australia, um, but it, yeah, like it's not, it's not passed on to other people. It's not an infectious to other people. It's just that they have it. So and yeah, and I, there, I think there, there are, are a lot obviously of Lyme people. people. Yeah. There are obviously people who definitely have symptoms very similar to what people with Lyme disease have, who haven't been travelling to these areas. So and and they're not crazy and imagining it. Obviously, they have an actual uh, problem. So is it is it likely that they've caught something a similar disease that isn't actual Lyme disease? Is that fair? But well, a lot of people do have um, like tick bites. Some people haven't been bitten by ticks. Some people are, are living in areas of Australia that do have ticks. Some don't live in those areas and haven't visited tick-related areas, but they still will often get similar symptoms. And the problem is that the symptoms are very vague. So if you've got headaches, you're a little bit tired. Um, if you've got like tingling, if you've got pain in different areas, there are a whole range of different diseases that can cause that to occur. It's not particularly Lyme disease. I think disease. I've got it. Yeah. So, so, and that, that's the thing. It's just this, um, this, uh, yeah, not non-specific symptoms that people are saying, oh yeah, well, you've obviously got Lyme disease and let's give you lots of treatment for it. So that, that's where the, where the concern lies. So, and what, what I was sort of suggesting in my article is that we need to identify what is causing it. So it, it, what, what we've been doing at the labs is we've been getting samples of blood from people over in, in America, putting that through our machines here, and they're all popping up positive for Borrelia, um, the, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease in our machines here. But then when we're running through the sa like um, similar samples from Australian samples, um, they, that's not turning up positive on, on our machines. Can I ask you, um, the machines that we to, to, to detect Borrelia, what are you actually detecting? Is it, like a, is it a, a genetic test or is it an um, uh, antigen test or...? The gold standard for it is, um, first of all, using an ELISA um, and then followed by a Western blot if mm -hmm. the ELISA is positive. So the ELISA is a screening test okay. and it has a, a, a large range of false positives that will come through. Um, and then if, if right. there's a positive test, then it will go through and um, be a much more specific Western blot. And that's looking for um, for both tests. It's looking for the um, the antibodies that your body is creating towards uh, the Borrelia bacteria. And so some people will get a positive test on the ELISA, but they'll get a negative test on the western blot and they'll say oh well i'm i'm testing positive for borrelia and it's like well no that's the eliza that's got a whole ra high range of false positives the more specific test is the western blot so so that's where some people get quite confused by it as well yeah i can and I, can, I can imagine a layman getting quite confused by it because because it it's a much more technical kind of <laughs> interpretation than yeah. yeah totally and then there's there are labs like any test has false positive rates and false negative rates and so um if you're sending your blood off to a to a lab um and there are some labs over in the united states um there are some labs in australia as well that that aren't accredited they're not sort of like following uh the the normal standards that their peers would expect and so they're coming up with a, a lot more positive tests i think it was like some of the some of the labs were testing positive like 90 percent of the time um, but then at accredited labs, this is over in the States, it was like 30% of the, the actual tests that were going through were, were actually positive according to the accredited Western blot that was being done. Is it possible that it's a species or a strain of Borrelia that, we, that isn't being detected by the tests in Australia or anything, like the one that's infecting people here? 
Yeah, well, certainly um, recently in the news that we're, we're talking about Borrelia maonii uh, that was discovered uh, over in America, and, and that was a different species of, of, the, of the Borrelia, a different type of the Borrelia. And so what they found was that it was still turning up positive on the machines right. um, that was still sort of like, yeah, getting everything positive on the Western blot. But then when they looked at it a little bit further and looked at the genetics of the, the actual bacteria and, and, and saw things a little bit more um, defined, then they found there was a different uh, different type or subtype of Borrelia that was there. So if, if it was a, a type of Borrelia, yep, it could be turning up our, our test positive, but it's not. Uh, it could be something else completely. It could be a virus. It could be a toxin from the tick. Who knows? So, and that, that was the point of my article, just saying, we don't know what's causing this. Um, let's have a look at it. Let's see what's going on. But then with me, it was just, yeah, everybody started trolling me from the, from the mm. Lyme community saying, how dare you not tell us that Lyme's not here? I'm like, well, I'm wanting to find out what's actually going on and have a, a scientifically uh, regulated test that we can help you uh, and be able to define what's happening. Yeah, it, it must be hard though if you're feeling all of these symptoms and you've you've paid lots of months of money to get a American lab t- that proves in inverted commas that you've got Lyme disease and everything to then read that no you don't have Lyme disease or it's something else or that. It kind of can. I can see why people might feel that you're making them look foolish. That they've spent all this money on a nonsense treatment or diagnostics and everything. I'm not saying that that you were trying to say that, but I can certainly understand why people would feel mistreated. Uh, well, I certainly, I, I want people to be using science and I want people Absolutely. to be having a, a regulated test. And, and if they're going in with, uh, with tests that have been done at an unaccredited laboratory and then trying to get treatment from, from a GP or, or another doctor in Australia, we're, we're not going to be treating it properly. Like We're, we're going to be doubting the results of mm. that test. So there's, there's no point in getting it done. So I, I just don't want people spending all that money, basically, because I'm a Scrooge and I want people to be Scrooges as well. <laughs> are unaccredited labs a real problem in America? Or is, that, is, it, is it the same over here or is it much more of a problem? Uh, there are America? particular labs that, that aren't accredited as, as far as their, their peers would like them to be. And, and so that, that's the same in Australia and in America as well. So, so there's certainly uh, like rogue labs, I suppose, that you could t- say uh, that, that aren't doing what we consider to be scientific evidence with, with their testing. Yeah. So the the other thing that we haven't really talked about as well is just the treatments um, for Lyme disease too. So and there's a lot of people that are talking about going overseas and, and having treatments in Germany. Uh, I don't know if you talked about that on the on the podcast previously, um, but yeah, people are spending thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to go overseas and to to have treatment in Germany. One of the treatments is heating them up to 41.6 degrees Celsius um, to like burn the Borrelia out of their system. The other people are spending like thousands of dollars on Rife therapy, which wow. is using like electromagnetic or radio frequencies to tune in um, to the same frequency that the Borrelia is to um, to then mute, mute it. Um, and yeah, like this has been uh, like disproven like decades and decades and decades ago. But there's still people that go, oh yeah, I put on this Rife machine around my head, and then mm-hmm. after I've had this time on it, I feel so much better. So I need <laughs> to like buy this machine and do it every day at home. So th- there's a whole lot of like really um, crazy kooky treatments um, that, that people are spending their money on. And yeah, like what, what I sort of get really up, at about, uh, up about it is that there's even Kickstarter campaigns that are being started to fund mm. people to go to Germany to have these like very, very bizarre treatments that aren't evidence-based. And so that's wasting not only their money because they're going over, but also a whole lot of other people that are believing that these treatments are going to be working for them. Yeah, it's false so hope. It's, yeah, well, it is creating false hope. It's creating a, a placebo environment for people. And, yeah, the, the other aspect of it as well is, yep, you've got people that have been bitten by ticks that may have some other weird, strange uh, bacteria or virus, et cetera, that are being sick. But you've also got a whole range of people that are suffering with atypical migraine that might have multiple sclerosis that hasn't been diagnosed, um, that could have juvenile arthritis, that could have adult arthritis. And these people aren't actually being treated with what they need to be treated with. And so they're, they're like having a lack of treatment and people are just like pasting everything with the same brush and saying, yep, you've all got Lyme, let's give you long-term treatments of antibiotics for it and that doesn't work either. And creates more problems. A long course of antibiotics, if that's not the actual problem, it's going to create more problems, not just resistance but uh, you know, gut microbiome uh, disruption and things like that. Well, I, I remember reading like in your article, Brad, that you said that this patient you were seeing 
her, her liver was basically being destroyed because of the antibiotics that she was on, like the long-term treatment that she was on for this disease that she didn't even have. And it's kind of scary. Yeah, so it was an example of one of my patients. But, um, yeah, she'd been on long-term treatment for about sort of six months, um, taking mm. a high-dose uh, antibiotic, which we usually would just use for a few days um, or may, like possibly a few weeks. And, yeah, like over time, she wasn't being monitored by the doctor that was treating her, wasn't having her liver function tested, and came in to see me because she was feeling much worse. And she was bright yellow, and, yeah, she needed to like have her liver saved. So she, she could have lo- lost her liver completely. She could have needed a liver transplant. And so th- these are sort of serious issues that are there. And a lot of the studies that have been done over in the States at, with people with Lyme disease, we find that if we're using about like four weeks, two to four weeks of antibiotics, we treat it. It's done. We- we've got rid of it from the body. Sometimes we'll use intra- intravenous therapies, but that's for like neuroborreliosis, where the, where the Borrelia is affecting the brain and they're, they're very, very sick and they're in hospital. But yeah, like once you're up at that month or so of, of using antibiotics, that's it. There's no benefit, and, and they've looked at patients using like placebo versus um, long-term antibiotics for six to twelve months, and there's, there's no difference between placebo and antibiotics in that long in those longer-term patients. So the the other thing that's happened, and the, there was a submission in the to the Senate inquiry that's going on at the moment. Uh, a submission was saying that um, that people were having problems getting pick lines put in, and and pick lines are uh, little catheters or tubes that go into your neck, and then the last part of that tube uh, ends up right by your heart. And so this is used uh, mainly for people with chemotherapy. So they get chemotherapy agents into their into their heart, so it doesn't like totally wreck their their veins and their arms or their or their legs. And it's also used for antibiotics sometimes, but it's quite like <laughs> quite invasive if you've got yeah. a piece of plastic hanging at the top of your heart. And so um, there was a there was a person that was talking in the in the Senate um, inquiry uh, with her submission, saying that she was disgusted that hospitals um, and emergency departments and and uh, that hospitals wouldn't put in these pick lines um, because they didn't believe that she had Lyme disease. It's like, well, we don't have a test to say that you have Lyme disease. The, we, we don't believe that this test is going to be like that this treatment is going to be helpful for you. And, and if you're wanting to have a piece of plastic lying by your heart for, uh, for six months, that's probably going to get infected. You're probably going to become septic from it. Uh, and it can, it can kill people. So this is why it's a big issue. If people are like saying, yep, if doctors are there going, yep, we want to treat you for Lyme, you've definitely got Lyme. Let's put in a pick line and yeah, like be like do a, a lot of dangerous procedures procedures, then that could kill people as well as the, the long-term antibiotics. Um, if we're getting like breeding uh, Clostridium difficile in people's um, guts, that's probably going to be a major problem as well. So yeah, there's a lot of, lot of issues at play. I do like the way you ended your article though, and I'm going to quote it because it sums it up per- very perfectly, I think. Let's end the conspiracy and work together to find the true cause of this mysterious illness and with science-based medicine. It's only then that we might be able to find a cure. And you're right. It's only through actual the scientific process, the scientific method, that we're actually going to get anywhere. Yeah, and that, that's the only way that we'll be able to help people and know that we're helping them appropriately. All right. Well, let's move on. And Shane, there's an article on sciencemag.org by Amy Maxman that starts off with the most eloquent of phrases... No buts about it. The butthole is one of the finest innovations in the past 540 million years of animal evolution. And it's a really interesting story about how not pooping through your mouth was a pretty important evolutionary step. Yeah, the dogma appears to be that um, once our common ancestors evolved a separate hole to expel waste... This, you know, there's a sort of a linear um, view of evolution, and that you know, this gave rise to much more complex creatures. You know, all of a sudden we could com- compartmentalize, and that gave us the ability to, you know, do other things. Essentially, yeah, we can eat while we're digesting a so, previous yeah. meal and stuff. We don't have yeah. to spit the digested, the undigested stuff out before we eat again. Yeah, and also it's, it also helps that you're not sort of polluting the area that you eat with the basically waste. Yeah, you know, because as we know, waste is n- not very clean. So. Now, there's been this, so this has been the dogma. However, there's also been this certain, uh, well, comb jellyfish that people have observed in the past to have, the dogma about these has always been that they've got single, you know, exit and entry holes, essentially, mm-hmm. that they eat and poop through the same hole. But um, other people in the past have noticed that they had these sort of pores on the outsides of their bodies that actually secreted waste. And yet, 
like, these observations weren't particularly conclusive. So this new study, this guy, uh, William Brown from the... Um, University of Miami in thank Florida. You, yeah, thank you. It's all right. <laughs> the University of Miami in Florida. He used a red fluorescent protein to feed his captive jellyfish and set up video cameras to monitor what actually happened to the waste. And he showed this apparently at a um, at a seminar. And according to the according to the article, people were gasping in surprise because they'd never seen this before. It very very clearly showed that these jellyfish would ingest this red dyed prey. Um, sorry, ingest it. Sorry, digest it, and then expel it through separate holes. Now, it sort of turns everything on its head because they evolved earlier than other other animals, like anemones, sea sponges, things like that, that actually have the old in and out through the same hole method, <laughs> basically. So this sort of turns the dogma on its head. You know, this turns that evolutionary story on its head. You know that. Wait well, a minute. Not well, necessarily. It, this just yeah. means it could be another convergent evolution thing it could where be. these jellyfish evolved an anus long before all the yeah. other animals did, essentially. Yeah, or, or, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's, there's any link or relation to them. Could be. Or the fact, or the, the other thought is that things like anemones then evolve to lose that ability later. That's a, then, exactly, yeah. And there could be and there, there could be many reasons for that. Apparently one of the reasons is, you know, in terms of currents and water currents, it's probably better to split, chuck it out of the same hole rather than the hole behind you. Rather than put it upstream or something yeah. and it comes back so down and gets you. It's, it just, I just like these sorts of stories that, you know, they take established, what we take as, you know, the sort of established fact or, you know, the established theory and they sort of look at it from a different, different angle and go, no, maybe that's not the way it works. I mean, we've got this very linear view of evolution. Mm. You know, there's this, there seems to be this kind of idea that everything sort of got better and better and it's not necessarily like that. Um, you know, things don't just sort of, things aren't striving to be multicellular or better. You know, it's just, it's about, it's about, good enough. well, yeah, it, it's about, you know, incremental changes that help you survive, well, help the animal survive better in a different environment, essentially. That's, that's a simple way of putting it. If, if that includes losing an anus, that's fine too. And I just, I just love the image of, that's uh, described in this article about the, uh, the whole crowd of scientists. I'm imagining them in a dark theater <laughs> watching the video up on the screen. And then suddenly they're seeing like just excrement coming out of these pores and everyone's aghast. <laughs> um, just like, and that's why I love science. When, when that, like, mm. they, a jellyfish pooing can make a whole room of, of scientists just, yeah, have these light bulb moments switch on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Excitement can come from the smallest and strangest places. It's very cool. Lucas, there's a lot going on in Jupiter. There's a Japanese satellite that we've lost, but let's start the astronomy stuff off with some interesting new evidence for the ninth planet in our solar system. We've talked before, Mike Brown, the person who is credited with demoting Pluto, uh, did some calculations with an assistant and they figured out that there was probably a ninth planet and now there's some new evidence that has come to rise, hasn't it? Yes. Um, this is obviously one that's been kicked around for, for many, many, many years. It's been proposed and then you know disregarded and proposed again and, and, and really what it comes down to is there's uh, often things that are that are discovered come about because of the observations of the effects that they have on other things. In fact, Neptune is a great example of this. Uh, this was a, a planet that was found because there were uh, effects upon Saturn and Jupiter, which couldn't didn't quite fit in with with what what was known at the time about what was in in in, the, in our solar system. So, you know, just through um, Newtonian physics, they were able to establish that, okay, something else must be affecting the orbits of these planets. And uh, they then proposed that there should be something big sort of here, and then they looked here, and, <laughs> well, there's Neptune, um, which is really cool. They actually found Pluto, if memory serves, uh, in a similar way, although it doesn't really match up with the effects of, uh, of uh, that, that suggested there was something there because it's well really 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 small, but uh, but yeah this is really how things come to be suggested about you know a rogue planet or a planet X or all the different things that's been called over the years. What is interesting now though is is there's there's growing evidence of disturbances that's like disturbances. in the force, in the force. <laughs> there's there's growing evidence of, of disturbances in the in the outer solar system particularly with with interactions with the uh, hyperbolic objects and so forth 
And this uh, this new team has, has has taken a look at the the math and basically uh, uh, linked up with other evidence to do with the fossil record and so forth. They've shown that there's a, a particular orbital period, which is somewhere sort of you know in the in the realm of 26 to 27 million years, where we we tend to get whacked by comets on a fairly repeatable regular basis. It's important to note there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. In, in, involved in these sorts of things as, as they try and piece things together. But that's also true of so much else in cosmology and astronomy. There's, there's so many pieces of information that fit together as a puzzle. And that's one of the things I love about astronomy is because there's, there's so little direct observational evidence to go by for so many things. And, I, you know, we talked about this so many times on this show where um, from this bit of information or this bit of light spectra or mm -hmm. these X-ray uh, observations, they've been able to extrapolate out just some incredible knowledge about the size of black holes, for example, or, the you know, the mass of a black hole or how it interacts with things around it. And that, that's just really, really cool. But uh, but yeah, this this has been sort of in the news again in the last in the last few weeks, and it, and it caught my my eye just because there's um, uh, there's quite a few things that seem to to match up. And you mentioned before about Mike Brown, he's uh, from Caltech, and he's he's really starting to to line up a lot of these things about this this planet nine. The the obvious question if, if people ask is, well, if if it is out there, why haven't we found it already? Because there's so many instruments looking out. But you've got to put into perspective just how far away this would be. It's proposed it would be on quite an elliptical orbit, so it, it basically would swing fairly close in to, towards the outer planets and then way out again, way out into the Kuiper Belt. And that's why it suggested that, that, that it may be there, because there are certain objects in the Kuiper Belt that are behaving in ways that indicate they are themselves influenced by something big. You would expect things that, that sit in the Kuiper Belt to be predominantly influenced by their orbit around the Sun, which is what, of course, we're all orbiting right now, but also there would be interactions between each other. They you know, would occasionally whack into each other or, or come close to each other. <laughs> but when you consider just how far apart objects are in the Kuiper Belt, if you were to sort of plot this out, if you see it in a, in a TV show or something, you, you tend to see a, a visualisation of, you know, here's the sun and they zoom out and there's, you know, some planets and planets and planets and they zoom way further out and there's the Kuiper belt and then, you know, if they keep on going, you'll see the Oort cloud and so forth. But those, those visualisations you see are just so massively exaggerated in terms of the, the distance or lack thereof mm. between these objects. They're under-exaggerated. Um, Almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, you know, these things are so far apart that it's that an interaction between um, one, you know, Kuiper Belt object and another is something that would actually be fairly rare. Certainly, you know, something that would affect its orbit significantly. So when they start looking out and they discover a few objects that are orbiting in a in a fashion that that suggests they're interacting with some other large body, this is evidence that is actually quite compelling. So. That's really what this is based on, and what's what's changing. And I, I think this is something we, I'm, I'm looking forward to keeping an eye on this, on on how this one develops, because this is not just wild speculation. There are multiple lines of evidence that are starting to stack up, and and to the question of why we haven't found it already, something that far out would potentially be very, very, very dark. Um, you know, the, the the amount of luminosity for something that that's far out, especially if it has a darker surface. I mean, there are asteroids that we can barely detect that are quite sizable just because of the 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 colour of the asteroid. They're not particularly Bright. reflective. Yeah. So, you know, you look at something, we, we measure ref reflectivity by its um, albedo, and uh, the, these things might be quite dark. Um, one of the, the moons, I think it's Tethys from memory of Saturn, um, has uh, a, a very dark side and a, and a, and a light side, like a yin-yang sort of scenario. Um, and uh, and its, its dark side of Tethys is, is almost completely invisible um, just because it's so dark. And it's also a, a very core cool mystery as to why it's like that. But anyway, that's another story. I think so, everybody has a dark side. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, tell us about Jupiter then. Uh, we've just seen a, a reenactment of the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet impact mm -hmm. from... <laughs> Uh, what well, was about fifteen years ago now? Must be yeah, kind of. More, I mean, probably twenty years ago. Yeah, the thing the thing that was exceptional about Shoemaker Levy was the 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 evidence, the scarring that it left 
on the surface of, of Jupiter. And when I say the surface, I mean the you know the top cloud layer because um, that's you know all we can see from here. But yep. but um, Shoemaker Levy wasn't directly imaged. It wasn't directly caught. We didn't see it happen. And I think it was about ninety two. I think from memory, Shoemaker Levy, and you know the the uh, evidence of it um, was became apparent over a few weeks after the event. And there were you know quite large you know um, uh, almost stains, if you like, on the uh, scattered around the the uh, the cloud surface, which was really really cool. Since then, there have been quite a few other impacts uh, upon Jupiter. I think there was the next one was detected about eight or nine years later, and then there's been several that have happened uh, since then. And it's proposed and accepted that it probably happens fairly often. In fact, Jupiter has always had this role in our solar system as kind of being a protector of the inner planets in many ways, just because it has such a big gravity well, it does suck things in. And, and, it, and you know, you've got to understand it's not just about something comes into the inner solar system and, oh my God, there's something big, I'll head towards it. These things might come in over and over and over again uh, as they orbit around the sun. And each time they come in, they can be partially affected by Jupiter, partially affected until they get close enough that the thing just sucks them in. And that's basically what happened with Shoemaker-Levy. It would have come in earlier, been perturbed by Jupiter, which would have affected its next return, and that's when it hit the planet. In this case, though, uh, again, there's been amateur astronomers involved. There was a particular uh, amateur in Austria and another one in Ireland who directly imaged, in fact, have video of this latest impact. And the, and the, the impact is literally just a flash on the side of, of, of the planet. So, you know, it's, it's nothing, no big deal in terms of the incredible images we got back from with regard to Shoemaker-Levy. But what was really cool was it was directly imaged happening. Now, this has happened before. This is not a new thing. But the fact that two astronomers captured it, and I bet there is more footage out there that other people have taken because both of these astronomers mentioned, both of these amateurs, I should say, mentioned that they just happened to be recording, just happened to have their scopes pointed at, at Jupiter. Neither of them were recording video for any reason other than using it for stacking, which is a really common way of getting good detailed images of, of planets as you stack you know, hundreds or even thousands of images on top of each other because the, the light then just gets you know, increased, increased uh, until you get some really nice imagery. So the fact that people can now afford equipment like that at home one of them was about i think it, one of them was an 11 inch telescope and the other one was only about a five or six inch telescope these are really quite wow. small scopes yeah. but they had webcams attached to them and they're so cheap now to do this sort of thing that at any given time most of the certainly the the planets you know up to jupiter at most of the time have got something trained at them by amateurs it would be rare now for something to occur on one of these planets if it was line of sight that we wouldn't pick up and that is freaking awesome to think mm. that there's so many people collecting data on these things now yeah and that's why we you always used to hear the um with the the mayan calendar thing everyone was going to say that there was this ninth planet in the solar system yeah good one uh but it was coming coming towards earth and it was going to collide with earth and no one was talking about this you can't get something like that past the thousands of amateur astronomers who are looking up every night now so it's like well, an yeah, early I mean, warning you know, system you, for us this is uh, one of one of the ones that happens yeah just about every freaking year is oh in in august the moon the, and mars is going to be as big as the moon in the in the <laughs> sky and stuff like that it's like come on seriously but um, but yeah, in, you know, going back to the ninth planet, that, that it's it's entirely plausible that it could be out there, and and yeah. and really, the, it's one of the leading theories as to what causes comets to be flung into hmm. the inner solar system. But yeah, the, you know, Jupiter's role in all of this is is that it has, we believe, protected Earth for 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 billions of years from what otherwise could have been, you know, quite a lot of big impacts because it just acts like a big hoover in our solar system and you know collects a lot of these things um in terms of what it was we don't know and, and it does occasionally fling them at us too though <laughs> well it's there would be look at it this way you're just playing percentages it, it, it what it does is it is it interacts um so something's on one orbit it then interacts with jupiter in some way or shape or form and its direction changes the vast majority of the time it probably would never was going to come anywhere near us anyway but Jupiter interacted with it and flung it off in a different direction. This is a numbers game. Um, but, but because it's there and it has such a big impact on its orbit, it would collect a lot of, uh, a lot of things. 
But yes, absolutely, particularly asteroids. Asteroids, which of course are mainly found in the astral belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, um, if they you know, stray within Jupiter's orbit, it will fling them. And there's a very good chance it will fling them inward. So that can be bad for us. And in the case of what hit it this, in this last week, um, we don't know whether it was a comet or an asteroid. It's, it's, you know, in terms of um, likelihood, it's more likely to be an asteroid because the asteroid belt is, is nearer. Um, but, yeah, could have been either. Who mm. knows? Could have been aliens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter what it was. Better it hits Jupiter than us. So. Well, for a while, maybe, you know, some people might have been thinking it was this poor lost Japanese satellite. Um, All right. So, tell us about this. This is the uh, Hitomi space satellite yeah. uh, that Japan launched fairly recently. It was like the 17th of February, I think. But they lost communication with it. Yeah. It was, and it was looking for uh, a little while like the thing had been whacked by something because very, very soon after Japan uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, uh, just after they announced that they'd lost communication with this satellite, there were reports from, uh, was it from NASA? I can't remember who it was. Someone, one of the agencies uh, indicated, oh, here we go. It was uh, a Joint Space Operations Center reported that five pieces of debris were found floating around the satellite shortly afterwards. That's never a good sign. That's, just, you know, <laughs> that's not supposed it, to happen. <laughs> it's generally bad. But what really cracked me, I mean, it was great to hear because they, they announced a few hours later that they had received pings. Um, basically, its, it's, it's ping was still working. They have working, a machine so that goes ping? Pings. Yeah, of course. All the machines go ping. Um, this, this machine, so it, it has a beacon on it, which is like a, a, a heartbeat. Um, here I am sort of beacon. And, and, it, and it's very, it's, one of its purposes, of course, is to find it if the antennas become oriented away from Earth because the, the antennas are, are very high-gain antennas, which means they have a particularly powerful uh, beam, but it has to be pointed in the right direction. So if your spacecraft becomes disoriented for some reason, then the antennas aren't pointing back at Earth, and of course you don't get those higher level of communications. But the the pings, the the beacons on the things, are more omnidirectional, so you'll pick them up, you know, regardless of the orientation. So at least they know it's there and it's communicating. And if it was hit by something substantial, that probably wouldn't be the case because it wouldn't take much mm. to completely destroy, you know, or break into many many pieces of oh, satellite. If we've all seen gravity. Modern. Yeah, exactly. You know, it might have been hit by Sandra Bullock or George Clooney <laughs> or something. So, it that that would cause problems. But um, uh, but in this case, it, it's still pinging. <laughs> so that's a good sign, and it, it's a really good sign because this is actually a really cool spacecraft. It was before they lost um, uh, communication with it. This thing has actually been apparently re- returning the highest resolution X-ray spectra they've ever had from a space. For, well, ever sorry, it's from anything. Mm-hmm. The the best X ray uh, uh, spectra, which is which is something we want. So they're yeah. really hopeful that you know they're still getting pings. They'll be able to orient it and they'll be able to get it sorted out again somehow. Um, and then you know it can continue its mission because it would be quite a loss if it wasn't. But the thing that did crack me up though was they they said, oh look, we've we've managed to to um, uh, receive the the pings from it. It's still alive. We're hopeful we can get it back. You know, sort it out and get it realigned. That's assuming it's not spinning, you know, crazily because without data, they don't know how to adjust um, for that. And without high-gain antennas being pointed in the right place, it's hard to get much data up to it or down. So, uh, but yeah. they said, we think the, uh, the pieces that were orbiting nearby must have been things that flaked off. They're probably not very important. Meh. So, well, <laughs> yeah. what, why? When we all keep hearing about how expensive it is to put stuff in orbit, why are you sending stuff up that's not important that can flake off? It's just it you just know, seems... it's the hood ornament and things like that's, that. It's yeah, nothing it's to. Just, it's like the warranty sticker, <laughs> and <laughs> it just seemed a little odd. Oh, well. I think there was a beautiful video of it um, increasing in intensity and decreasing in, in, in its light. And so they were saying that it was spinning, obviously, as it yes. was going around the planet. So that's mm. is that what's causing the ping to occur? Like once every rotation, it, we're getting contact with it? it? Look, it's more likely to be, and I don't know about this particular spacecraft in detail, but it's more likely to, to have omnidirectional antennas, which it doesn't really matter where it's, where it's pointing. You'd still get a slight Doppler effect from those things, but it would be minimal because we're talking, well, speed of light here for the communications. But yes, the change in luminosity would be caused by spinning. And obviously, you know, there might be um, uh, dark and light parts of the craft and so forth. Oh, and it's solar the, panels, so it's, they're reflective, yeah. sort of mirror-like almost, and probably going to be uh, reflecting well, that sunlight in a 
uh, yeah. haphazard way if it's tumbling through space. Yeah, but solar panels generally don't reflect the light. They collect it. They tend to be They're dark. They're shiny. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, They're pretty and enough. shiny, yes. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, so, yeah, look, the, the problem with the spin, though, is, is, is the, 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 the biggest issue is getting it back under control when you don't have enough data to correct for it because um, most spacecrafts are, uh, are constantly adjusting um, uh, their their attitude, so as in you know their how attitude. tilted and so forth. <laughs> um, so so they have you know little um, little gas jets and stuff like that on them to to make those micro adjustments. And typically, most of them use oh, they, they use different um, ways of self aligning as well. A lot of them will use certain constellations to help with their alignment. Other ones will use the sun because it's really handy and it's bright. So there's there's different things that they can use, but it depends what they put on the spacecraft. But if something did hit it, even you know a grazing impact, it could have sent it tumbling. And and it, yeah, potentially can be really really hard to correct, even if they've got the jets to do it. You know, as in the, the little little gas jets, um, which could get it back under control. Not knowing which ones to fire when is is a problem. Mm. But it is there's still hope, uh, as Emily Lactawila of the Planetary Society tweeted, a communicating spacecraft is a spacecraft that maybe can be saved. So. We'll keep an eye on that and see if it does get saved or if it destroys all the other space stations and spacecraft out there and finally plummets to Earth, wiping us all out. <laughs> uh, probably won't be that. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> well, speaking of extinctions, though, uh, findings published in the American Journal of Applied Science suggest that the Siberian unicorn may have lived alongside humans and, in fact, went extinct much, much later than previously thought. Penny, Elasmotherium sibiricum probably wasn't quite the beautiful horse-like creature we imagine unicorns to be today, was it? No. In fact, despite the, um, the unicorn name, it was actually kind of rhinoceros relative. So please <laughs> forget any image of a unicorn you had in your mind and picture essentially... A great big muscly rhinoceros, but with a very, very large horn. Yep. So it's yeah, it's not it's not really a unicorn. However, it is a very interesting kind of organism, and this um this discovery has quite interesting implications for the way that we do date things. So I saw a couple of articles like saying Elasmotherium Sibericum you know, has been found to be living at the same time as humans. It's the origin of unicorn myths because people couldn't have come up with that by themselves. No, no, no. They had to see. <laughs> but what I thought was interesting is um, this has been found in a relatively remote site and it's what I thought is that this site in Siberia was actually like a little refuge. So even though it became extinct about, I think half a million years or th no, 350,000 years ago in most places. In this particular locality, it was carbon dated and found to be about 29,000 years ago. That's a big difference though. That's a huge difference. That's and 320,000 years that things yeah. have been living in their little sanctuary, this little pocket somewhere in Siberia. Yeah, like it's an enormous difference and there's no – there's no look, I haven't been able to come up with any reasons why people are questioning the radiocarbon date. What seems more likely is that it did survive here and it just kept on going and it like, oh, what was that show with the dinosaurs? The they, Flintstones. Remember they were living in a valley? No, 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 there was like <laughs> – <laughs> Well like done, Brad. That was, you didn't miss a beat there at all. <laughs> <laughs> TV show with the dinosaurs. Yeah, no, it's it's no. <laughs> Well, that's the most accurate, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. I'm sure there was like a... some show where, like, I don't know, there was like dinosaurs living in a valley somewhere and it was just one valley. Anyway, so kind of like that, whatever that show was. Okay. What we, what we want to know is can were humans able to ride these creatures? <laughs> Well, only if they made it into a car and they just ran with their little feet. <laughs> it's a pretty big, beastly animal, though. It'd be a mm. tough thing to to grapple with. Yeah, it's got and a I very don't know horn that would skewer you. I'm not sure if people were living in that area at the time or not. Yeah, I think there was a there was a crossover around the time from people, but yeah, maybe not in that zone. 
Yeah, exactly. So even though people were around at that time in this particular place, and, I mean, who knows if it's coincidental that, you know, a place where this thing could live maybe wasn't so hospitable for people, I don't know. But what I thought was really interesting is when you look at the article is when they first found this material, they assumed it was a lot older than it has been found to be by radiocarbon dating. And that's because of a principle that paleontologists use called biostratigraphy. And it works really well sometimes because there's a lot of species that are really wide ranging. Like wherever you go in in the ocean, you're going to find, you know, this kind of foraminifera or this kind of insect on land or something. They seem to be everywhere. And so these species change. And so if you find, you know, I don't know, let's say a a particular species of mosquito, you say, oh, okay, well, this sediment must date from such and such a time. And if you find another species of plant, you go, oh, okay, that's Glossopteris, this is from such and such a time. Now, because of the other um, organisms and because of the time when this Elasmotherium, which is probably not a really great one because big mammals are not usually useful for this sort of thing, but because it was known to be, extinct 350,000 years ago when the, um, this fossil was on Earth. That was what this age of this whole sediment was assumed to be. But radiocarbon dating gave a very different age. And, look, I don't know if there's any question. I know that sometimes radiocarbon dates can be funky. I don't think they're usually, you know, because if it was um, because of the way radiocarbon dating works, it just couldn't give you a date of 350,000 years. Um, yeah. I don't think I don't think this is the time to. If you're really interested, you can look up why. But, you're not going to have an error yeah. margin of that yeah, big. exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, but what is interesting is that it means that, like, radiocarbon dating is also not free. It's not cheap. Um, that there's probably in this area other sediments that have been assumed to be at a certain age because of the fossils found in them, but. If this was a kind of a refuge area, an area where for whatever reason it maybe it was a bit isolated or a bit cut off and species survived for longer than they did elsewhere, then perhaps the ages of some of those sediments could be a bit off too. And I think that's really interesting. It wasn't just the unicorn that survived. It was the other animals around yeah. as well that may have survived longer. Yeah, and we might be thinking, oh, well, these sediments here are from this age, but they're actually a lot younger, which could have... Like I'm not very familiar with Siberian geology and so on, but I mean that could be like if we if we found out that the sediments in you know our local area were three hundred thousand years different, I mean that would have huge implications for the history of the area and yeah. so on. So I think that's quite interesting because it's often you know there's often a bit of received wisdom. Oh, if you see this, it must be this. But it's interesting that when something gets tested, it might yeah. not necessarily confirm that, and you have to come up with an alternate idea. So I, I thought this was interesting, but not for the unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it kind of brings us full circle back to the Lyme disease. Mm. Uh, you may see all all the evidence might be there on the surface to suggest it is Lyme disease, but when you actually go in and look for the hard data, yeah, it may turn out to be something different. Yeah, that, that's, that's nice symmetry with the start of the show. <sighs> uh, very cool. And I, it was I the only one though who, when when you know, because obviously it was all over Twitter, it was all over Facebook yeah. about this, this unicorn and so forth. And when I read about it, and, and it was in Siberia, and I was talking, you know, scientists making this uh, uh, this announcement of, of the difference in the, in when they thought it had gone extinct and blah blah blah. The first thing I thought was, this is clearly a misquote. This you know. This Russian, for some reason, they're always Russian when they're talking about <laughs> Siberia for me. This Russian scientist. I wonder why. Gone, <laughs> yeah, this, this Russian scientist has gone, you've found new animal with unicorn. And, and they've gone, oh, it's a unicorn. <laughs> no, it's a unicorn. <laughs> and it's, it's ended up all over there. Well, we'll run with it yeah, as, yeah. You know, as press release go. That, that sounds good. It's a unicorn. Well, did yeah. it have an anus? That, that, did it have an anus, though? And did it, did it produce rainbow farts? That's what I want to know. <laughs> According to this artist's impression, it probably has an anus, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't show the farts, though, so we'll just have well, to... Well, okay. It actually looks like a fairly vicious animal. Yeah, yeah it does, doesn't it? Jeez, judgy much? <laughs> well, I don't know. One of, 
I've seen a few um, reconstructions. Some of it looks quite yeah, nice. Yeah, like plushy. in some, it looks almost like a horse, quite hairy. Other ones, it looks like an armored tank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was six foot tall. Yeah. Uh, does that mean like when we say six foot tall, do you mean like from wouldn't... head to foot, or do you mean like from like the top of its shoulders? I think like that like scary. tall, not long. Okay. But yeah, it was fifteen feet long. Yeah, six feet tall. Yeah, so I don't know if that's including the horn oh. or not. Either way. I'm probably going to run. Well, if I see and, it. and around Just... nine thousand pounds, apparently, you know, of, of of weight. If there were humans around, this would absolutely have been hunted, and probably hunted to extinction. Yeah, that's probably why they're yeah. extinct now. Yeah, I, I hope it took down a few with it. <laughs> now we're rooting for it. <laughs> Go unicorn! Wow, <laughs> this is—it's a majestic beast. Of course, I'm rooting for it. Majestic. Okay, um, taking out a few early humans. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Paleo that, bitch. Well. (laughs) (laughs) well, Thanks for the show title. Um, All right. That's our show. As always, we'll have all the links to everything we talked about today on scienceontop.com slash 220. And there you can find our social media links and ways to get in touch, leave some feedback. You can email us, feedback at scienceontop.com. And we really appreciate all those people who kindly leave us reviews on iTunes. And as always, thank you, Penny, Shane, and Lucas. And thank you, Dr. Brad McKay. It was wonderful to have you on today. Thank you very much for having me. And what's the uh, best place to go to on on the internet to find you? Um, You'll probably find me on Twitter mostly at uh, Dr. Brad McKay. So D R B R A D M C K A Y. Uh, Otherwise, I hang around Facebook as well. So. I'm everywhere. And, of course, we'll have links to all of those in the show notes, as usual. This episode was edited with talent and panache by Marcos Benemu. And we'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. People love the science. Paleontologists in Kazakhstan have now found remnants of Elastomotherium sibiricum, also known as the Siberian unicorn. That's right, unicorns are real, which means paleontologists are just two neon dolphins away from validating your sixth grade trapper keeper. (laughs) Personally, I love unicorns. I cannot wait to find out what a real unicorn looked like. Jim? That's not a real unicorn. That's a hairy rhino with scoliosis. I really have a hard time imagining that thing pooping rainbows. I still can, but it wasn't easy.